on today's Airborne. You heard right, the FAA wants the EAA to pay for Air Venture staffing. Pilatus unveils its new flagship, the PC-24. And Cessna's new Turbo Skylane GTA takes wing. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Despite a clear mandate in opposition to user fees and similar funding mechanisms oft discussed by the FAA, the agency has decided to start enacting some user fees of its own. And they've begun by making a pretty aggressive demand for EAA to pay them to staff Air Venture. EAA Chairman Jack Pelton spoke at length with ANN about this and says the FAA has already presented them with a bill. They have sent us a bill to saying this is what their services, not, and they're not, they're not asking to pay for their labor, controller labor, but their expenses associated with the event. And there are items in there that we don't necessarily feel that they're items that are essential for Air Venture. So, you know, there's the back and forth on how do you get down to what is the real number? And then mm -hmm. at the same time, we're asking the question of the House Aviation Caucus and some of our elected officials as to, you know, what what is this really in the realm of being in bounds or out of bounds as far as can they do this? Pelton says this action by the FAA comes as a surprise, especially after Congress addressed the agency's staffing issues. There was the rumblings of it prior to Sun and Fun before the legislation that we thought would prevent this was put in place where we had the whole controller furlough issue and staffing issues and the, the contract tower issues. And so going into Sun and Fun, we knew Sun and Fun was affected. We thought that you know there could be fallout, but once the legislation was put in place, it all went quiet and actually, from a timing standpoint, was a surprise. While this demand on AirVenture is alarming in its own right, Pelton says he can't help but wonder what's next. The bigger concern and issue, of course, is what does this really mean for general aviation going forward? You know, these pop up all of a sudden, there's a cost transfer to general aviation overnight is pretty devastating. Where could it go next? Is it services that people have assumed have been funded and have been I don't want to say taken for granted, but are, are been part of the norm over the last many, many years. All of a sudden, are you going to walk in and say, I, you know, I really got a question on an airworthiness issue? And they'll say, well, we can answer that question. Just write me a check. Pelton added that, quote, GA should continue to contribute its fair share to FAA and national airspace operations through the current aviation fuel tax. EAA will, however, vigorously oppose efforts to burden aviators with costs for which the FAA already receives funding and has budgeted as part of its stated mission of providing a safe, efficient national airspace system." End quote. ANN will have much more on this developing story. Pilatus Aircraft has unveiled its newest airplane, the PC-24 which it says is the world's first super versatile jet. This innovative, entirely new development by the Swiss aircraft manufacturer marks what Pilata says is the creation of a new segment in the business aviation market. The PC-24 is the first business jet worldwide with the ability to use very short runways, paved or unpaved, in a cargo door as standard. The jet also boasts a spacious cabin which can be configured to individual requirements. Work on the prototype in Stans is in full swing. The rollout is scheduled for the third quarter of 2014. The PC-24 will take off on its maiden flight towards the end of 2014. Certification by EASA and the FAA is planned for early 2017, and the first aircraft will be delivered immediately thereafter. Cessna conducted the first production flight of its Turbo Skylane 182 GTA at the company's facility in Independence, Kansas on Tuesday. The aircraft has the distinction of being the first modern single-engine aircraft powered by a piston engine specifically designed to run on Jet-A fuel. 
Industry observers have noted a looming fuel issue for general aviation in most parts of the world. Avgas, typically used to fuel most single-engine aircraft, is becoming scarce, expensive, and even unavailable in many parts of the world. With the advent of a single-engine aircraft designed to run on the much more common jet A fuel, operators can now access many more parts of the world without worrying about the unpredictable availability and price of increasingly scarce Avgas. The initial test flight lasted two to three hours, and Cessna senior test pilot Dale Bleakney said everything went as expected. A Boeing 747-8 Intercontinental successfully completed its first test flight this week, with a package of performance improvements including enhanced GE engines. Boeing's continuous efforts to improve the 747-8 family have resulted in an accumulated 1.5% gain in fuel efficiency since the first airplane was delivered less than two years ago. These new improvements will give operators an airplane that is an additional 1.8% more efficient. While 1.8% may not sound like that much, Eric Lindblad, Vice President and General Manager of the 747 program, says, quote, Improving fuel efficiency by another 1.8% saves the airlines approximately $1 million per year in fuel per airplane and reduces the carbon footprint." End quote. The test program will also validate the design changes and demonstrate the operation of the horizontal tank fuel system on the passenger version of the 747-8, which was deferred from the initial deliveries. The new configuration will first deliver in early 2014 and be available for retrofit. Solar Impulse, the solar-powered airplane of Swiss pioneers Bertrand Picard and André Borschberg, has completed the second leg of its historic cross-country journey. After a successful first leg on May 3rd, where Bertrand Picard flew Solar Impulse from the San Francisco Bay Area to Phoenix, Andre Borschberg was at the controls for this second leg, which also set an absolute distance world record in solar aviation. The Phoenix to Dallas trip was over 830 miles. The previous distance record already belongs to Solar Impulse, when Andre flew 693 miles from Switzerland to Spain in May of 2012. The third leg of the Across America journey from Dallas to St. Louis will be flown by Bertrand Picard. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. GE Honda Aero Engines announced today it is nearing completion of FAA certification testing on its HF120 engine. The final remaining test, the medium bird ingestion, is scheduled for completion in July. More than 95% of the certification documents to the FAA have been submitted with more than 84% already approved. A total of 13 HF120 engines have accumulated more than 7,300 hours and more than 9,700 cycles 
during development and certification testing at nine different test locations. This included accumulation of 3,000 cycles on one engine as part of its endurance validation program. Rated at 2,095 pounds of thrust, the HF120 engine succeeds Honda's original HF118 prototype engine. GE and Honda redesigned the engine for higher thrust and new standards of performance and fuel efficiency, durability, low noise, and emissions. The HF120 has the ability to operate 5,000 hours between major overhauls. Testing is expected to be completed in July, with FAA certification expected in the fourth quarter of this year. Cessna is making progress on two key lineup additions for their family of Citation business jets. The company said during a program update at eBase in Geneva, Switzerland. The Citation Latitude and Citation Longitude programs are both meeting performance and technical objectives with both programs bringing new performance and innovation to two different categories of business aviation. In response to customer feedback, Cessna designed the Latitude with a roomy six-foot-tall cabin and a flat cabin door. The Latitude will have a range of 2,500 nautical miles, a max cruise speed of 440 knots, and a configuration for seating seven to nine passengers. Announced at last year's eBay's, the Citation Longitude is designed to be the first Cessna Citation jet capable of extended intercontinental routes. Cessna expects the Longitude to be a strong addition in the super mid-size category of business aircraft. Aspen Avionics announced Tuesday that Piper Aircraft has selected the Evolution Backup Display System for its Piper Archer and Seminole line of aircraft. The Evolution Backup Display is a fully digital, independent flight display system designed to replace mechanical backup instruments used in Part 23 glass panel installations. Initial fleet customers for the new all-glass panel configured Piper Archer include the Florida Institute of Technology, with an order for eight Piper Archer TX training aircraft and CAE Oxford Aviation Academy, taking delivery of 22 single-engine archers in 2013. The Aspen Evolution Flight Display System is a PFD, MFD, and hazard sensor cockpit solution for general aviation aircraft and rotorcraft platforms. Highly compatible with existing aircraft avionics, the flexible Evolution Flight Display System lets aircraft owners install all Evolution Flight Displays and options at once or separately as their needs and budgets permit. Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, is now officially a steely-eyed missile man. Or maybe that's Rocket Man. He had to sell some artwork described as abstract to do it, but Allen has acquired a rare Werner von Braun designed V2 rocket that he plans to display at his Flying Heritage Collection on the grounds of Payne Field in Everett, Washington. The World War II relic was originally manufactured at an underground factory near Nordhausen, Germany. NBC News reports that it is a Middlework GmbH V2 rocket. Only 16 are known to exist, and it will be one of only six in the United States. The V2, while notoriously inaccurate, was responsible for the death of 9,000 civilians and military personnel, according to a BBC report posted on Wikipedia. The Flying Heritage Collection's fact sheet about the rocket indicates they were cumbersome to launch in combat conditions and could not be built in sufficient numbers to turn the tide of the war. Several of the missiles were brought back to the U.S. after the war, and many of the designs used in the rockets provided the basis for systems that eventually were incorporated by the U.S. ballistic missile and manned space programs. It's Friday, and given our lead story, does anyone want to guess what ANN's Editor-in-Chief Jim Campbell has on his mind today? Yes, it's the FAA versus the world. Here's Barnstorming.
Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, I don't have to tell you that uh, things are getting rather convoluted on the political front. Yesterday, we were briefed by EA's Jack Pelton on the very short notice they were given in which the FAA has decided that they want money. They want money from EAA to do their job. The annual air venture, EAA, Oshkosh, whatever you call it, flying, is one of the grandest, greatest, largest aviation spectacles and learning centers on the face of the planet for a week out of every year. It is required, in my opinion, for the FAA to do their job. They have a control tower there. They're supposed to man it. They're supposed to staff it. And yes, there's going to be an awful lot of traffic there. But if they weren't at Oshkosh, they'd be somewhere else where somebody would have to do their well job. It's become increasingly obvious that all things aviation mean very little to Washington. The FAA takes its lead from the president. This administration and many of its support uh, organizations, personnel, and staffers have decided that aviation is a whipping boy, that it can be exposed to all kinds of abuse and all kinds of costs and all kinds of user fees and all kinds of things that will and have been strangling it. Enough's enough. In regards to EA Oshkosh, this is FAA's best opportunity to show the world what they do, how they do it, and how they do it professionally. Because with uh, all due respect to the FAA staff, who are at times really quite extraordinary, FAA's leadership leaves something to be desired. Michael Huerta, shame on you. You know better than this. You want somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars or so from EAA to do your bloody jobs. That's shameful. There's no, no reason for it. Not when there's so much waste in the FAA budget what you're wasting on consultants, what you're wasting on failed programs, what you're wasting on things that go absolutely nowhere, but sure sound politically expedient. Sir, look at your budget, clean up some of the nonsense. Do not victimize general aviation and sport aviation so that you can make a political point. The fact of the matter is this, we paid for you to begin with. You're in our tax dollars, you're in our fuel taxes, you're in a variety of taxes. Do your bloody job. But for God's sakes, do not attempt especially on short notice, to damage the greatest event that showcases the amazing world of American aviation, and in fact, to a certain extent, international aviation throughout the world, with your greedy little hands out for no good reason, when in fact you've already been well paid, when in fact it's already been budget, and when in fact, damn it, it's your job. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell, and I guess I'm counting my pennies. With sequestration sweeping the military aviation world, this year's graduates at the U.S. Naval Academy will not receive their traditional send-off by the Blue Angels. And while that's disappointing for every cadet, the impact of the Blues grounding reaches far deeper into the Annapolis community. According to a report in the Baltimore Sun, local restaurants and other Annapolis businesses will not get the influx of business during graduation week that they would normally see in a year that the Blue Angels were flying. For example, Watermark Cruises in Annapolis has 13 boats that carry people on the tours of the area, and normally they are full on air show day. This year, the company reports that only two boats are booked, and they estimate they will see more than 1,700 fewer customers. Other businesses say they normally see a huge spike in customers on Blue Angels Day, and that will not likely happen this year. Even so, this is not the first time the Blue Angels has missed performing for graduation at Annapolis. The paper reports that they did not fly at Annapolis in 2011 due to a safety stand down, and the team had a scheduling conflict last year. I guess you could say Annapolis has a case of the blues. Well, that's our program for Friday, May 24th. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. Join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.